KSO Show is back. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you from K-State Online. You can find all of the great KSO work at On3 or right here on this YouTube channel or podcast platform, however you are consuming the content. Uh, We thank you for doing so as we get ready for another midweek pod, recapping everything that Chris Kleiman had to say at his Tuesday press conference. We talked Saturday after the game. He is a guy that uh, is probably showing the most frustration that we've seen outwardly from him since he's been at K-State based on how things were going. And even though his his mood and his attitude was maybe a, a little bit cheerier, the message was still the same where that's a guy searching for some answers and that is admitting that his football team's not playing very well right now, or at least not to the standards that they would like and be accustomed to. I think that there are some other you know, places where you would say that how they've played, and eh, about anybody would take that right now. But as things currently sit, it is not a uh, pretty sight for the Wildcats. So we'll uh, we'll have to take a, a peek and see how everything looks moving forward for the three and two Cats as they get ready for Texas Tech this weekend. Before we dive any, into anything sp- specific, D.Y., I mean, you were there yesterday. Uh, what what was the vibe you got from Chris Kleiman, and what was kind of your biggest takeaway from what he had to say in the 30 minutes that he chatted with everybody? Yeah, just from everything that I've heard, he was kind of, I don't want to say on a rampage or anything like that, but he was a lot more stern and, and probably chewing a little bit more butt than he's accustomed to doing in the days that following the loss to Oklahoma State in Stillwater. And it seemed like he, it's, a, it's a bit of a process. You I like that he doesn't do it often because if you don't, then when you do it, it, it comes in loud and clear mm-hmm. for the people who the message is intended for. Jerome Tang is the same way. But I also like the way he's doing it because he did seem a little lighter on Tuesday. So I, I think it, the closer you get to that next game, you do have to start build building these guys back up. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a smart move. I think if you're a coach, you're – you have to either be the tyrant 24-7 uh, like some guys uh, appear to be or you are like Chris Kleiman that you're not going to ever get you know too high or too low. But when a problem comes up and you realize that it's not necessarily getting too low, but it's getting fired up and, and needing to go after your guys in a, in a different way to get their attention and you know not give the message that, hey, everything's all good because everything is not all good for K-State football right now. That's, that is clear. Um, But it doesn't mean that that's going to continue to be the way things are. And this is a team that all the pieces that are there, there is an avenue and you can see and make the case for how things are going to get better. And that's what it falls on the shoulders of Chris Kleiman to do is to make sure that these guys bust out of whatever funk they're in, improve and find ways to get better. However, uh, our first clip of the day of Chris Kleiman, I thought that this was a very telling moment yesterday uh, he was asked if you know in in all of this if he could find a bright spot this season or something that stood out here's uh how chris Kleiman started that and that answer um you know uh probably it's hard to say because we've been so inconsistent you know um jack bloomer has been a bright spot for us Okay. All right. Well, so uh, he takes a little bit to answer the question. And then by the time he thinks of his answer for it, uh, he leads off with Jack Bloomer, who prior to the Oklahoma State game had been average to below average as a punter this season and hadn't really needed to be used all that much I would, uh, I would outside say, of like the Missouri game. Yeah, I would say he just didn't have to be used much. There were a few games. Oh, there was uh, what was a Troy, maybe. Or he shanked a few, or maybe I was Mizzou when he shanked a few. It's like shanked two, but and I, I realized the net yardage isn't necessarily there, or the raw yardage. He did have one big boomer of a punt, but I will say, like percentage of ones that are getting downed inside the twenty, he's among the best in the Big Twelve right now. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess he's uh, he's punted seventeen times this year. Uh, and he's, you know, he's, he's put himself in better positioning as of late. Uh, the first couple of go rounds, I mean, he punted five times in both Detroit and Missouri games, uh, and, and those weren't great showings for him, but he's been better since then. It just, it was very telling to me that that's where Chris Kleiman went to. Um, and I mean, it's, tr- it's true. You look around offensively, it's tough to pick anybody out. I mean, maybe you would say how DJ Giddens has handled his expanded role, but, 
Uh, and, you know, there's the one massive game and then everything else has been kind of eh, whatever, just based off of some other circumstances. So you're not going to pick anything offensively and defensively. Uh, you're not forcing turnovers. You're struggling to, to get pressure at times. There's not a whole lot of good going there for you. So it makes sense that that would be his answer, but it's just very telling that he would come out and be that forthright uh, with how he felt and that, you know, most coaches I think will find, you know, oh, hey, we've done this well. We've, we've improved here. We're doing he all could, this. Chris what, Kleiman, he have, what he could have said was run defense probably, but you're, you're probably giving up. Because I think they're number one in the Big 12 still mm-hmm. in that category. I think they're number four in the country. In that category. Are you sure? Ian Boyd told me that they suck. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the, the big plays are still hurting them there. So, you know, it, it does – a lot of it does go back to consistency, which is what he brought up because, you know, there's a handful of players having pretty good seasons. But they all have one or two duds at this point in the year already. Um, you have – no one's been consistently elite. We'll put it that way. Yeah. They're having moments where they are or games where they are, but it's not to the point where they can count on it every every game, and that's where they need to get. Yeah, well, another area where it's not necessarily big plays, but it's a lot of little plays that kind of got K-State in trouble early in the game against Oklahoma State. Chris Common talked about the corners, and uh, although I believe he meant that the coverage was pretty soft and they still needed to change that, uh, it almost came off as if he was calling the way the corners played on Friday night soft, which I'm sure some people were thrilled to hear. They're like, yeah, uh, they were soft. Uh, here's what Chris Kleiman had to say about their defense and, you know, the corners on how they could improve some things. Yeah, so kind but, of- but we've got to correct it. You know, we were too soft. I mean, that was something that we talked about even at halftime, and we got better in the second half. But um, we can't be so so soft on those easy access throws. Those 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 definitely hurt us. But you're also playing with guys aren't Jacob Parrish and stuff that it's it was a little bit different environment. So that's why we have to find ways to – to give those guys some relief too, whether we put somebody out and, and, and buzz a, a backer or safety or roll a corner up a time or two. We've got to find some ways so that they're not playing one-on-one football for 70 snaps. That's a long day. All right, so obviously talking about the coverage being soft, but I think that's something that a lot of people have noticed and complained about, not just this season, but in, in plenty of seasons prior, that why are you giving so much room to – these receivers, especially, you know, on shorter yardage situations. I mean, it's clear that K-State, they have to try and help the young guys or the inexperienced players because they're just not ready in some circumstances. I mean, how does K-State improve this, and what did you make of how Chris Kleiman handled discussing, because that came off a question talking about uh, the the amount of field goals they gave up versus touchdowns and limiting them to just one offensive touchdown in the game. Yeah, I mean, he still wants the defense to get to a point where they don't have to play soft, that they can just challenge guys on the outside consistently um, and and make them go for it. It, It's tough to do that right now because you're giving up so many explosive plays. You do have to play soft a little bit more at the time if you have a defense that's susceptible to give up the big play. How do you prevent that? Well, you got to keep everything in front of you, which means playing a little soft. So – I get it. It's a back and forth issue, but hey, if they go up and challenge guys and they start getting beat over the top, people are going to be yelling and being pissed off about that too. So you got to take one thing away. You, unless you got 11 pros on that side of the ball, it's going to be hard to take away everything. Well, yeah, and they they don't have anybody that right now is in a position to to think about you know anything other than just improving themselves to get to, I think, an average to above average level in the big 12. And it's, it's only going to get tougher as the season progresses and you face teams that uh, have better quarterbacks than what Oklahoma state did. And some teams that have better receivers than what the Cowboys had. Now uh, the next thing that, that we'll dive into a couple of things that Chris Kleiman talked about regarding the quarterback situation. Uh, he was again asked about Avery Johnson. I think that's going to continue to be a question all season for the time being until Will Howard ups his game again to, to what we saw at the end of last season and uh, it was just, you know, kind of a forthright question on if the kind of the math on Avery Johnson had changed and on if he was going to redshirt this season. Nope, it hasn't. You know, it, it's one of those things where, um, once again, uh, I'm, I'm going to trust the guy that's running that room because I love the guy. And Colin Klein 
knows what he's doing, and uh, we have a good plan. All right, a couple of questions here, D.Y. What do you think that plan is, and who do you think it is that initiated the conversation about putting Avery into the game Friday night? Because if you, you know, coming off of Friday's game, I would have said that, okay, it had to have been Colin Klein that was pushing to maybe get Avery some snaps. But that almost made it seem like, you know, if Chris Klein said he's trusting Colin Klein's judgment there, if Colin Klein wanted Avery Johnson to get some play in that game, he would have gotten it. So what do you make of this situation right now for K-State and how they're handling, uh, you know, the, the reps that Avery Johnson could get in a game to maybe help give you a boost? It's to go, in terms of a plan, he said they have a plan. I, I think it was more general and not necessarily specific. I, I never thought all along that the red shirt was really in play or dictating their direction, and he confirmed that it wasn't. But I, I think the plan, so to speak, is to, you know, incorporate Avery Johnson when necessary. And – Personally, I think it was necessary in Stillwater, but obviously I get the gist that it was Colin Klein's decision because I think multiple times there, and this wasn't him throwing him under the bus, but Chris Kleiman like hinted, like I'm giving Colin Klein the autonomy to coordinate and to lead this offense. And I think that's not just from a play calling standpoint. I think that's also from a personnel standpoint. I, so it, it would make sense to me that Kleiman at one point, the head coach of Kansas State, was like, should we consider Avery Johnson here? And I think Colin probably wanted to to probably stay zeroed in on Avery. That's me speculating just off the clues that we do know at this point in time. I think that there's still a plan to play Avery Johnson, but I, I think their plan, if there was one, was general and basically – you know, when you need an extra layer to your offense, we'll get Avery Johnson's feet wet here and there like they did against Missouri. When we don't, and you know, then we'll, we'll stick with Will Howard because, you know, something that we talked about even before the season and I brought up a couple times during is that it is tough to play both guys without losing a bit of rhythm. But – that, that decision is going to become a little bit more simpler if the offense doesn't start, you know, performing at a higher level because what it's just the, uh, I, I think the nature of uh, how we react as humans, but also of what that position entails. It's the most important position on the football field, but when the offense doesn't play well, you know, the, the finger is ultimately going to get pointed at the quarterback or else, or at least a change would be considered just to, to maybe provide a spark. And and maybe that's where we get to. I think for me, this game is probably the turning point on that one way or another. I think you're probably right. I think Will Howard has to go out and just have, he has to have a good game. Right? He, it, it doesn't have to be spectacular. It doesn't have to be overwhelming, but they ha- they need to go out And, you know, even if they lose, there's a realm where it's just a really good football game and the loss isn't on the offense or on Will Howard. And if that's the case, then Will Howard is going to continue to get his shots. But if he would would play a similar game to what he did at Oklahoma State this weekend in Lubbock, I think you're right. I think the the conversation, the attitude changes and they have to seriously consider doing something because – even with a loss to Texas Tech, you know, you're probably not going to Arlington, but there's still a lot that this team wants to do and accomplish this season. And one thing that they want to avoid doing is being a six and six team or worse. Like that, nothing looks worse than that. And I know there's been a lot of talk this week, if you're on the, the KSO message boards, about what the expectation should be and how things should be elevated. Well, to me, it's unrealistic to think that K State is going to turn into what Oklahoma was and winning, you know, 13 of 15 Big 12 titles or whatever it ended up being. Uh, nobody in the Big 12 is going to end up being what KU is in basketball. But it is realistic to me. And as somebody that my whole life, you know, grew up with two parents that went to K State. So I was a K State fan from birth. I went to K State and everything. To me, my expectation is six and six is a lousy season. Seven and five is fine. It'll happen every once in a while. If you can win eight games every year, 
that's that's the real deal to me. That's that is probably the sweet spot where if you said K State averages an eight and four season over a you know ten year time span, and you're going to have some really good ups like Chris Kleiman did in 2022, and you're going to have some downs like you know what I would probably say 2021 was, where they went seven and five, they ended up getting eight wins because of the bowl game. That's probably about where I see things. Six and six is a is a lousy season to me, given the positioning of where K State's at right now, and with the coaching staff they have in place and the talent they have. And I think that if something goes south in Lubbock this week, you have to seriously consider some changes to make sure that you don't get to that number. Because as different as this team is from last year's and as many guys as you lost from a season ago, you should not be translating last year's season into the next year with a six and 16. That's just, that isn't supposed to happen. That's not how it's supposed to go down. I mean, I know Baylor, did that they were what they were worse last year they, were they five and seven last season or six and six maybe so baylor did that after winning the big 12 title is it, is it the big 12 championship game curse because uh both baylor and oklahoma state fell off a cliff kind of after meeting and we're now kent state didn't have to fall off a cliff that like i said this is fork in the road game you beat texas tech then you're going to clear a path to being four and one in the big 12 but They've taken a step down so far. So, but and TCU's a shell of itself. So, mm-hmm. like the the, the non Texas and Oklahoma teams go on a run in twenty one and, and twenty two and um, kind of dip the the following year. It's been a bit of a trend. I would agree. I, I look. Uh, I got to ask what I was going to predict for the rest of the year. And I said eight and four. I, I think that is probably the the middle ground of of what they can still accomplish and you know even if they lose they can fall to three and three like I, I don't know that six and six should necessarily be on the table but it, it's certainly a you know a very real possibility at that point and I would agree six and six when you bring back the starting quarterback from a big 12 champion the starting offensive line from a big 12 champion um and, and the big 12 not being worse this year than it was last year, six and six would be incredibly disappointing and would seen would be seen as very much under underachieving and a, and a failure of sorts. Well, especially when you consider right now that Will Howard has stayed healthy this year for the most part. I mean, he he got banged up in the Missouri game and he he you know probably played through the UCF game when maybe we we thought that he wouldn't, but. If you go back and look, you know, from the the time that Bill Snyder came back to K State for 2.0 and to now, the the seasons that I would tag as monumental failures, the the six and six and worse seasons for K State, that the way that looks is 2015, and we know what happened there. Jesse Ertz gets hurt, very you know, start of the season, so it is the Joe Hubner and Cody Cook show the rest of the way. Two guys. That again, I need to not be so harsh on the person, but the player, there's no reason why they should have been playing quarterback in the Big 12 conference. And they were having to do it. That team found a way to go six and six. So in my world, I see six and six or worse as a failure for K-State football. That that year, six and six was honestly a freaking success based off of what they had. And they played a lot of competitive games too within that. I think really the Oklahoma game was the only game that they actually got smacked around, and that was 55 nothing and ugly, but Fortunately, the Royals were playing in the ALCS there, so everybody could forget about it. But that's that's that one. And then the last year of Snyder, they went five and seven, and we know that there were quarterback problems in that season. Obviously, uh, they had to play different guys. Injuries popped up again. And then you think about climbing twenty twenty that season failure. Now the COVID year, I don't take it as seriously as other seasons, but yeah. it is worth pointing out. Skylar Thompson got hurt in the third game of the season or in the second game of the season, right? Uh, or third game it was. Sure. They lost Arkansas State, beat OU, got hurt against Texas Tech. Tech. And Will Howard had to come in as a true freshman. And so, again, you lost the quarterback, weird year, whatever. And after that, they've been able to survive. Now, they've done it despite losing quarterbacks. But you've had something monumental happen in those years to tank you. And also that last year, Snyder, like I said earlier, with a staff case state has in place right now, Six and six doesn't seem like something that should be on the table for this staff. For that last year of Bill Snyder, six and six was something that was clearly on the table because that was just 
littered with guys that weren't entirely sure of how to run a Big 12 football program in the year of 2018. Totally different story right now. That's why it's really important that they come out and play better this week against Texas Tech and, and get this thing jump-started because, yeah, 6-6 six and six is going to get a lot of people to jump off the wagon and, and be very, very down on how things go. And it's going to be a momentum killer coming off of a Big 12 title and everything else. And now, I mean, the guy that helped get you there last year, I mean, he was – Probably one of the main reasons why it happened. Who knows if Adrian Martinez plays quarterback all year if they win the Big 12 title. I know a lot of people that, you know, after last season would have said no. This year, I'm sure those same people are probably going, well, you know what, maybe. Who knows? Uh, Chris Kleiman said he still believes in the offense and Will Howard, but did admit that uh, Will has to clean some things up. Yeah, he, he's got to take care of the ball better. Um, and, and, you know, I like him to be aggressive, but he, he can't be – um, you know, to a point where it, it's putting the team uh, and the offense at risk. And there was a couple of throws, um, you know, last week that uh, absolutely he knows he can't make. Um, he hasn't made those in the past, to your point. Um, and, uh, you know, we believe in Will. Um, let's not forget he helped us win a Big 12 championship, so we, we're not going to give up on him like I think people want us to. Um, and we've got a guy that's running that room – that's knows what he's doing in Colin Klein. And I love CK. Got a ton of faith in Colin Klein, as everybody else should, uh, be in K-Staters, and we'll get this figured out. First question. You, did you think it was weird that Chris Kleiman said that Will Howard is trying to make some throws that they know he can't make? It seems like, I mean, maybe it's true, but you think about his size. And- I, think was, I think he meant like decision. You okay. can't make that decision. Yeah. Okay. Because I was going to say, I mean, I, I think there are a lot of throws that Will Howard can make. It The decision-making is clearly the problem right now. And it's probably in that realm where, you know, he's probably talking about whenever Will Howard tries to throw, like, the 35-yard post route to Phillip Brooks down the middle of the field. It's like, uh, yeah, that's a throw you can't make. Nobody can make that throw because Phillip Brooks isn't catching that ball. Uh, I mean, wh- where do you think Chris Kleiman's – level of belief and trust in Will Howard is at right now to where, I mean, he's obviously questioning some things, but he still has that belief. Will Howard is his guy, all of this stuff. I mean, what, where is this? Like, how, how close are we for him to say, I, I got to jump ship? Yeah, I mean, only he knows. But, I mean, he did open up and reveal that they considered, you know, at least inserting Avery Johnson into the game last Friday in, in Stillwater. So, there is some leash there that's being, you know, at least considered. So that's what I would, how I would describe it. Now, how long I, th- you know, anyone's guess. I I think he does believe in Will Howard, because I also think that Will Howard has earned the right to kind of pull himself out of this. And while the season is still in the balance and you still have that leeway, I think in terms of if you beat Texas tech, you can still get to four and one of the league and so, and so forth. I think that's why he's still getting enough rope to pull himself up or obviously hang himself. Right. Um, theoretically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We, we don't want anybody going, you know, Brian Kelly on you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so We'll we'll see how that goes, right? Um, and and, you're, and fans are have every right to disagree with that process and with that approach, but I think I would do it the same way that Kleiman is doing it now. Now, I, I think he has to present a united front when speaking about him publicly, and you want to throw all of your weight and support behind him so that he has all the resources and confidence. He needs to excel and and play well, but yeah, for me, I I, I guess I'll, I'll do it like this. If I was a head coach, Will Howard would be my starting quarterback in Lubbock. Yeah, if Will Howard plays like he did against Oklahoma State, and you're the head coach, who's your starting quarterback when they come back home against Houston? Yeah, then then that's then I, that's where I seriously consider making a switch if that happens again. Yeah. Okay. We'll because now, because now you're three and three, you're one and two in the Big Twelve. Yeah, 
And, and you have two still, games at home that you have to win. You have yes, to win because you're supposed to win them. Things get dicier. Things get shakier. Um, probably a lot easier for a true freshman to make his first career start at home. Against so, Houston. Or yeah. I guess TCU, so, actually. TCU, yeah. Yeah. So if you're going to go with Avery at any point, it makes sense to still wait another week. Yeah. It's kind of crazy that we're in this position where we're even having these conversations because I I – Came into this season expecting us to only have to talk about Avery Johnson being great in garbage time or, you know, in like spot duty where they have a couple plays for him, not where we're realistically talking about him having to take over. But Will Howard has been bad with his decision making. Now, part of that, and I've been on this train for a while because we saw what Will Howard could do when he had capable receivers last season in Malik Knowles and Cade Warner. So without those guys this year, and Chris Kleiman talked about the receivers and how they can improve and how they can be more effective uh, this coming week. Everything from uh, schemes to uh, them doing a great job of beating man coverage or sitting down in zone, um, protection, um, getting the ball out on time, um, making the right reads uh, with with quarterback. I mean, it's collective. It's across the board. It's not It's not just one thing. It's all. It's, uh, uh, as well as us running the football better. We didn't run the football well enough on Saturday or Friday. So Chris Kleiman, you know, p- puts it at all angles there, basically saying, hey, like this, this, and this can all be different, can be better. But it's clear that the receivers are not pulling much weight in this, you know, realm of the offense as it currently stands. And we saw that. There appear to be some effort plays every once in a while that can be questioned. You wonder how in sync Will Howard and his receivers are. Currently, that's an area that needs to improve for K-State right now, and it just hasn't yet. I mean, where, where's your confidence level in that, and, and where do you think Chris Kleiman is and and how he sees the receiving you know thing play out? Yeah, some of the breakdowns that have occurred that may appear to the average <laughs> – excuse me, average fan that it is Will Howard's fault. Some of that has been on the offensive line for an execution mistake that kind of – you know, pushes Will Howard into a, a poor play, or some of that is on the receivers because they are not getting open, because they are not making the right reads, because they are not on the same page. I mean, it's what he said. I I, I guess I can I can paraphrase what what he kind of shared, you know, to a point. But at the end of the day, like, it's not me saying, "Oh, a head coach is right about everything," but he's right in this regard that the offense is not did not crumble in Stillwater because of one facet or one position or one area. Like it was a culmination of errors in a multitude of spots, multitude of positions, and in a multitude of ways. And, you know, at a high clip, like frequent. And that crescendo just made for a disaster. One of the things that I I thought about, this is I'd have to go back and look, but props and credit to whoever – uh, kind of spurred this thought in my head with within one of the comments on the KSO YouTube. I think it was after uh, either the Sunday or Monday show, but they basically talking about the receivers, like, well, like who recruited these guys? Well, it's fair to ask all of that because now K-State is under what their fourth different wide receivers coach uh, since Chris Kleiman came here, Jason Ray, Courtney Messingham, Thad Ward, and now Matthew Middleton is here. Now, obviously, a lot of this cannot be put on Matthew Middleton. He's only been here since like January, February. February, something like that. Like it's not been a long time. So this is not necessarily on him, but it's fair to question those guys before. And I, you know, I think Thad Ward was doing some good things, but he here, here's the thing. Away. When you run an antiquated offense, receivers aren't going to come play for you. And they ran an antiquated offense yeah. under Courtney Messingham. When that, when you throw it 75% of the time and you're only snapping the ball 50, 60 times offense a game, receivers don't want to come. And that's what they didn't recruit receivers well for a little bit there. But that's because if you're a wide receiver, would you want to play for that offense under Courtney Messingham? No. So, um, and that's not to dismiss dismiss it, but they're still dealing with the effects of that. Now with transfer portal, you do have an ability to maybe flip that tide a little bit quicker, and maybe that's something that they should have done. Um, but they probably thought they had done that too because you you probably thought you were going to get more out of R.J. Garcia up to this point, and he's not doing anything. Well, you thought Keegan Johnson, Johnson. And you thought Keegan Johnson would be your number one wide receiver. You thought 
Jaden Jackson would be a little bit more consistent instead of fade away after a couple catches every game. So, I mean, I get it. Target the recruiting, but it was kind of a product back in the day where you're running an offense that is built on the running game and ball control and snapping the ball when there's two or three seconds on the clock and running as few plays as possible to keep the other team's offense on the field. And no wide receiver wants to come play for that offense. And no wide receiver did want to come play for that offense. Um, and fortunately, it feels like they've they've made some strides, at least in the last class as well. I mean, Trey Spivey is a yeah, guy that people are really product, excited about. And that was like, a product, product of Klein system. They went out yeah. and they got, they got a Trey Spivey. They got an Andre Davis. They flipped a power five commit at receiver. They went and signed uh, Keegan Johnson in the off season who had, you know, a litany of power five offers. Some from some being from blue blood programs like Texas A&M, not that they're a blue blood program, but you know, el- higher profile programs like Texas A&M, like Notre Dame um, that were also involved there. So, I mean, part of it is uh, they need another year of recruiting like that at the receiver position uh, to probably, have a better room that is more suited for this offense and more for the modern game, but they're not there yet. Should they have done a little bit more from the transfer portal? Maybe, but you, you know, spots are spots and, and, you know, they, they filled them the way that they did at the end of the day, they need to get more production out of the guys that are there because the, so, you know, regardless of whether they could have more talent in that room, uh, the guys that are there are underachieving as well. Yeah, definitely a spot right now that you would point out and say, hey, that's they're going to be heavily involved in the receiver uh, market again when the transfer portal opens after the season, and we'll see where it all kind of goes from there. One final thing from Chris Kleiman yesterday. You know, we, we talked a lot about the quarterback and the receiver and, and how that all plays out. But at the end of it, Chris Kleiman basically just says, hey, everybody shares blame for what took place on Friday. Everybody's got to be better. Uh, we went against some good players, and they got their hands on us, as well as we didn't have very much time to throw the football. Um, it's not a collective just receiver issue, guys. We've got to protect better. we got to throw the ball on time better. Um, we've got to run routes better without question, but it's like why didn't we – you know, run the football well at times. Well, the offensive line and uh, the running back and the tight ends and the wideouts cracking people and the quarterback making the right read, it's never going to be one person uh, or one position. And that's where, you know, I've been doing this a long time. The successful teams have all 11 guys on the same page and all 11 guys playing with really good technique. And that's not what we're doing right now. I think that last part there is the important thing because it does feel like at the end of last season when K-State was playing their best, it did feel like all 11 guys were on the same page on both sides of the ball. This year, it feels very disjointed. It feels like everybody is kind of lost and confused on what needs to happen. And, you know, again, you know, this offensive line, they got a lot of heat early in the year. It kind of cooled off there. Um, And I think because of how bad the vanity numbers were for receivers and quarterback in the game on on Friday night. Uh, they kind of get lost in the shuffle there, but they struggled. They got beat pretty good towards the end of the game when K-State needed to throw the ball, get chunks to move down the field and try and score. Um, they, they had some bad moments in that game that, that were pretty obvious, uh, but it's everybody that Chris Kleiman says, and that that's apparent right now. And that's honestly, you can look at it, two ways. That's either a very big problem that everybody right now needs to figure something out, or you can look at it as a positive and say, okay, if everybody is down and kind of struggling at this point in time, it might be an easier fix than what we we would normally think. Um, now, there are some positions where I think the fix is, is either not going to happen or it's a major overhaul that it might take, but as a whole, K-State being what they are right now, the fix might be more simple than what, what some people would assume based off how they played Friday night. Because, I mean, teams are going to play really bad games. And I think K-State is a team that they're struggling right now, but they also just played a really, really bad game on Friday. And it's probably worth, you know, rinsing your hands of a little bit. Yeah, I, if I was to guess, that's the worst that they'll play all year. And if not, then they're headed for a little bit more trouble because um, – I don't know if you can't beat Oklahoma State playing like that. You're probably not going to yeah. beat anyone playing like that. And and secondly, you know, to to corroborate what you know what was shared by head coach Chris Kleiman, and is when it looks that bad, there, there's more than one problem. Yeah, we'll just uh, have to see how it all goes down in Lubbock this weekend. And 
uh, see what kind of fixes are in store for K-State. It, it will be certainly uh, interesting to watch, not just what's on the field, but also everybody's reaction out of it because – uh, this is this is a major turning point in the season for K State right here. This game in Lubbock is going to probably determine a lot of future outcomes this season. Maybe not necessarily certain games, but it's going to tell us on if K State's equipped to handle some of the more important games that are going to be left on their schedule, and also how they're going to bounce back once they finally get back from Lubbock, because then they'll have two home games that you just you have to win because those are beatable teams right now, especially. TCU, who's going to be without Chandler Morris for that game. So they're going to be on their backup quarterback in all likelihood. Uh, any other thoughts from yesterday or that you need to get off your chest right now before we uh, give a little breather to everybody and then prepare for uh, Friday's pregame pod? No, we're good. Let's go. He just doesn't He doesn't want to talk too much more Cats football right now. It's, it's a pretty depressing thing at this point in time. Uh, but hopefully – Things are in the right direction, and it'll be a much more cheery mood and environment come Saturday night. Uh, I I hope so because you know after a after a loss, it's a little bit tougher to dive through everything. Wins wins are so much more fun to cover in any sport. I mean, it's it makes things a lot more enjoyable when you know you're going to show up and not just get a, a, a close game because I guess technically it was a close game Friday night. You want a fun close game. You don't want a uh, an ugly close game like what happened on Friday. So, and I don't know that K State and Texas Tech have played a ton of like fun close games lately. I think that K State's played in a lot of stressful games with Texas Tech that have been ugly. I mean, 2019 was that way. 2021 was that way. Honestly, 2020 is probably the best they've played against Texas Tech uh, under under Chris Kleiman. They got their lead and Skylar Thompson gets hurt, but Will Howard was able to hang on Bless. to it. And yeah, last year was good. But it got a little too close for comfort there at the end after the hot start. But I'll give you last year. Uh, it started off really fun. I mean, Adrian Martinez game, was running all over the place. The games in Lubbock have been ugly, though. Yeah. Yeah, they have. Uh, I mean, the 2019 one, that was like the ultimate Courtney Messingham offense and the, uh, the, at that game. It was like low scoring at halftime. Uh, before, I think before. Trick uh, plays. Yeah. yeah, trick plays. Oh, man. I I can remember on the field. So and this was when I was still working at K Man. So I'm I'm recording video for uh, Power Cat Game Day, and I'm down on the field. It's the second half. I mean, it's getting late in the game, and and the great Grant Flanders looks at me and says, "Oh, they got him. This is over here." Right before that fourth down, and I said, "I, I wouldn't say that. I I I think that like this could be like fake punt, and they're gonna get." He's like, no, 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 it's over, it's over. And then, what do you know, the fake punt happened. Uh, I can remember, though, I went up at halftime of that game, and I, I said to, to John, and you were probably in earshot, and I just, I just said, uh, before Chris Kleiman, I think, started using this publicly, I said, uh, Courtney Messingham needs to find his nuts. And uh, I, he, they did kind of. They scored 24 points in the second half. They won by a field goal. Do you know what the score of that game was at halftime? Six to three. Oh wow! Yeah, it was uh, it was bad, and then uh, everything kind of started popping off because they went back and forth pretty quickly. Uh, within the first five minutes, Philip Brooks caught a touchdown pass from Skylar Thompson. Then Sir Roderick Thompson answered, and then the one I remember, Josh Youngblood had his kickoff return for a touchdown. Uh, and then what ultimately ended up being the winning score for K State, uh, the the great, the legendary. Jabaston Taylor caught a big touchdown pass uh, from from Will H or from Skylar Thompson. And personal story from that, uh, you know, former K State media guru, and uh, now with the Tennessee Titans, Emily Starkey went berserk on me because I got in the way of her picture after Jabaston Taylor scored the touchdown. Because I too was trying to get a shot with the video camera, and uh, she came up to me afterwards. And I don't know that we've been on speaking terms since then. Uh, so, you know, we were we were great friends for a while there. We had class and stuff at K-State. And then uh, I think she she wanted as much Chabaston Taylor as I did. So that was uh that was a fun little moment and, and, there. Twenty twenty one was the Felix game. Yep. 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 The the safety that, that changed it all. Boy, <laughs> that was uh that was a season that also could have gone pretty poorly if they lost that game in Lubbock yep. and I'd have to go back and, and look and, and to confirm like where things were at at that point in time. But, um, 
yeah, things were in a bad spot. I mean, they were three and three going to Lubbock. They had just lost three yeah. straight at O State. And they were down what two touchdowns there? Two, three? Yeah, well, they were down 14 immediately. The, I mean, yeah. they the Texas no, scored yeah, the first yeah, 30 the seconds, of- and it was 14 nothing at half, uh, 14 nothing after the first, and it was 24 to 10 at halftime. Yeah, and I think even worse when he got the safety, right? I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was 24 12 when they got the safety. That was okay because yeah. they got the ball first and second half and didn't score. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I think yeah. if I if I'm looking at it right, what happened was K State went three and out to start the second half. They got the ball first. They yeah. went three and out, and then Ty Zintner. 63 yard punt that was down at the four yard line. And the first play that Tech ran in the second half was the safety in the end zone. Uh, K State got the ball. They only took six plays in three and a half minutes. And uh, K State scored a touchdown on a fourth and one at the Tech two uh, to, to get their touchdown. And then, you know, they took off from that point moving forward. And things uh, went kind of swimmingly uh, after that. They, they dominated the second half without scoring Tech 15 to nothing. But Lubbock has been a weird place for K-State to play. Tech has been kind of a weird opponent the last couple of seasons. Uh, but K-State you know, has only lost to Texas Tech uh, one time in, in over the last 10 years. So this is a game the Cats have to win. Historically, they've done it. It just may not be pretty, and it certainly will be uncomfortable on Saturday night in Lubbock. So that will do it for Derek Young and I. I'm Mason Voth. Thank you for watching and listening to the KSO show. We are back on Friday morning where you can get the pregame show where we'll have all the uh, stuff you need to get prepped for the game. Also our best bets and a look around the big 12 and anything else to uh, get you ready for the cats and the red Raiders down in Lubbock this weekend. Thank you for consuming all the content at KSO head over to on three for much more of it to get uh, the more talented writing accolades of, of Derek young and drew Galloway. Uh, to get the the real info and the, the great stuff from them. You can also see our Big 12 power rankings that are up there right now. K-State took a little bit of a nosedive, and Oklahoma ascended to number one, but a lot of other great information with inside of that. But that will do it for us. Thank you for watching and listening to K-State Online.